2024, next year, it, it, it's like nine months. Uh, last year I asked the question, what will 2024 look like? Um, Someone an idea, what will the future look like? 2024, lots of AI, right? Some other interesting things that are coming? Nobody. I'm going to point out, it's like a North Korean volunteer. <laughs> no? <laughs> well, Gartner, and we all know Gartner, right? They publish like six papers a day, and whenever they publish something, it should be right. So, But they said in 2024, 65% of every application that is going to be built is low code. I sort of had a hard time believing that, that actually 65% will be in low code. Maybe if you count only Excel add-ins, etc., then yes, you get it 65%. But talking about real applications, I find that hard to believe. Shocking fact, but let's put that aside. So, um, summary already, uh, talking about low code versus pro code. Um, if you want to determine when you should absolutely go for no code, low code, right, or pro code, it's not really possible. So, Thank you very much, that's the end already. <laughs> but if it was that short, then probably I wouldn't be standing here. Well, it could be that short, but I have something to tell. So the next uh, 30, 35 minutes maybe, I'm going to tell a little bit about local pro code and the benefits of the code. So at this point, yeah, it's already the end, but you still listen to me, so you feel betrayed, right? You feel like sad Pikachu. <laughs> and what my intention is at the end of the session is that you sort of look like, you know, Maybe not doing it next week, but you feel happy because you know a little bit more about low code, pro code, and no code stuff. At least that's what I'm aiming for. So I'm going for an aha moment. No reaction? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 exactly. But you see a few uh, people there, uh, several wars, for example. Um, his wife died, and basically it was too late, and he was like, okay, I need to find something. So next time, I'm quicker, maybe wife number two or three, so that's some iterations, again, like with software development. But he invented Morse code to send electric signals, and well, so eventually, a lot of people, that's something Steve Jobs on there with this aha moment. But you need to understand a little bit on where is low code going to fit in our arsenal of cool, heavy stone tech. So with a typical low code project, if you take a look at development velocity, with no-code, low-code tools, you can start pretty high because you get a lot out of the box built for you and you just have to click and hope for the best. But you start off with a very high velocity off the charts. And at one point, once you start getting into the limits of the platform, you sort of see that the velocity drops down. And what is happening, do you think, at that point where the line is like near flat? You need a custom component. The platform no longer fits your needs and you're going to a meta engineer to a Java engineer, but someone that knows actually how to code and they need to build something. So, no code, pretty cool tool, but once you start hitting the limits, it's done. You need to find something else. On the other hand, with your typical pro code project, it's very predictable. You know, up front, I need to set up my environment, I need to get a virtual machine maybe in the cloud running. So, I can already predict what is my velocity going to be. And if I hit a certain component that needs some more work, I know, okay, I'm not going to be that fast. So it's very predictable. And also from an expense model, um, you can either think about how does low code and uh, pro code look over time if you're going to run it inside of your business. And for pro code, it's very steady. You need some servers maybe, maybe some web app licenses, etc. So you start off with a small amount and it grows over time with your application. And how does that look for no code? You have no idea because you need to buy extra licenses, extra services. And then one feature that you need, well, that's premium, you have to pay extra for that. And especially with Microsoft, we all know the licensing model, it's bad. Just to give you an idea, low code and no code, we all say it's pretty easy to understand. But the licensing model, just take a look at the licensing model of Power Platform, it's like 36 pages right now, just to understand how to license your application. That's like the entire manual for some applications, right? So you can say, all in pro code, right? It, it's predictable. It's uh, I know what I put into it. I know how much I need to pay at the end of the month. So all in, and I'm done. But there might be an actual use case for low code. So how can we make sure that we know exactly what we need to choose? There are some things that you can sort of match together, and it's velocity, flexibility, the time to get the skills that you need to use the product or use your language. The ease of customization, so how easy it is to actually modify something, and what will it cost you to actually develop something. 
And for pro code, it's the set phase because yeah, velocity is very low. On the other hand, for low code, it's okay, it's great. But fusion dev, and, and what's fusion dev you're asking? That's if you take the best of both worlds. So you're going to take a little bit of your uh, pro code, so you build something as an extension, but you use the quickness and the, the rapidness of your low code section. So we all know, for example, Pega, Mendix, etc. You can use that for the front end, maybe a build an Azure component where you do the deciphering um, and encrypting. So you combine it. And Fusion Dev is it's, it's, it's in the middle. So it's, it's quicker than your pro code, but it's slower than your low code. And again, with flexibility, um, how flexible do you want it to be? With pro code, you control everything. So you're very flexible. And with low code, well, it's whatever your vendor that you chose provides with you. There's no, but I want it to be that color. Well, maybe there's a single button for that, but besides that, that's it. You get what they provide. Fusion Dev, well, if you can't customize it, you can build something to customize it for you to an extent, but still you're limited to can you communicate with that service? Maybe you have something running in a SOAP interface and it's not working. So, borrow for that. So it's also again mediocre. Time to get on skills, and probably we all know starting to learn a language, C sharp. Some of you might have started with classic C before even turning into C plus plus and C sharp, or maybe ESM or something like that. Um, it takes some time to get there before you understand. Hey, this is what an object actually does. Object-oriented program for me was a pain in the ass when I started, but eventually you'll get there. With low code, well, there is no skill, so it's pretty easy to learn. It's just take and hope for the best. And with Fusion Dev, it's a bit of both. You get the easiness from the platform itself, but if you have to extend something, you only learn like a little bit of JavaScript that you need, a little bit of C Sharp, maybe a little bit of Quantum. Whatever it is that you need, you only learn a little bit to extend what you're doing, or at least trying to do. And for the ease of customization, um, so we're flexible and we can uh, create some stuff and modify stuff. But if you want to change something in your uh, pro code situation, you have to be rather your map app, do a deployment, do a pull request, you name it. It all takes a lot of time. Well, on the other hand, with low code, someone presses the publish button and it's done. And again, with Fusion Dev, you have the easiness of low code, so you can click the platform and publish, and everyone can see the change. Pretty cool, pretty easy. In terms of quality, you might say that's not the best option we have, true best. But every advantage has a disadvantage. And cost for development, we all know since Proco takes a lot of time to build applications, it will be more expensive, you need more people on board, a front-end engineer, a back-end engineer, maybe a full-stack engineer, a data and AI engineer. All with low-code, you basically have one person clicking on icons and you have an application up and running in weeks, days, whatever you're building. And with Fusion Dev, you still have some engineers working alongside person building an Excel, I don't, I don't know what they're building. But at least you get a combination of both. So it's, again, mediocre. And now the main question is, who's the winner? Well, there's not yet a winner, because being mediocre might be good enough with smoke face. <laughs> Always like it. So, okay, the confusion that might be working, but why? And for that, I want to take a look at who is going to use what, and what are they doing with that? And the first one, the no-code people, uh, no code is sort of like um, clicking an icon and that's it. You just drag an arrow to something, um, very easy, straightforward, and you don't have to do a lot, and it's citizen dev. And their idea is that everyone can build an application. And most of the time, these people start up somewhere and they will eventually end up at your office as well to ask you all the questions that you try to avoid in the first place. But you have to deal with that. And then we get to the more experienced people. Um, they start to use logo because they have to do something. There are people that also build formulas in Excel and, and Office and PowerPoint, whatever. And they're called the IT or power user. And typically, they can customize applications with scripts. Again, Excel macros, etc. But lucky enough, those people actually Google something before they ask you a question. So it's at least an educated question before it reaches you. That's a good thing. And then we have the absolute pro code, and that's the people in here. Ooh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> pro code people on the extended platforms with plugins. And it's specifically on platforms right now and all the building loose applications. But that's the people building like the plugins for WordPress, etc. 
they know what they're doing, and they're like the, the, the elite of the company, right? You're not the elite? Yep. Right there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need people to do that. <laughs> this is going down at all. Um, so thinking about what are they going to actually do? Uh, we have uh, sort of the end user, power user, and we have the business led and the enterprise developers. Uh, what do they do? Well, the first question you should ask is, are they actually full-time developers? So we can put a label on them that they are like idiots, but are they actually full-time idiots? That's the question, right? <laughs> <laughs> so for the end user and power user, no, they're just part-time fiddling around with whatever it is that they're doing. But the business-led pro developer and the enterprise IT developer, they're actually full-time development most of the time, and they're supposed to know what they're doing. And for the preferred tools, so what are they actually using? For the end user, it's typically no code. So they know how to open something, and when an icon changes on the background, then they're already like, okay, I can find my application, can you help me? And then you say, well, it changed the icon, I can't help it. That's like those people. And the power user, they use some no-code and no-code, so they open Excel, they're like, okay, it's not enough for me, I need to extend it, let's Google something and fix it. So they're doing really cool stuff. And the business that pro developers that are people that are doing pro code already, so they actually know how to program. But most of the time, they also look into using some low-code components just to get things working, get it speed up. And they're like, the Detroit principle, if someone has already done it, I'm not going to redo it again. But who are they actually working for? That's also an important question. And the end user is typical the individual user. It's the, the, the selfish prick of the office, the what's in it for me situation, and if they don't get a benefit, they're not going to do it. So that's typical of those users. The power user, they are more like, okay, if I can achieve something, then the whole team gets there, so I'm doing it for the team. So they're already thinking not only about themselves, but also about your team. The business that pro developer, that's typically something doing for a department. They are like, okay, we have several teams doing something. If we are just clever and bundle everything, then we can get out of the department. And the enterprise ID developer, well, that's typically the person doing everything with a full backlog for years. Mm -hmm. That's not recognizable for most people. But what is the strength of the logo? And if you look at it, we know who is using the tools, when are they using it. Um, but why would you use it, right? And from a technical perspective, it can accelerate your project delivery because, well, there's not much you need to take into account. And there's no whole CICD process that you can set up. And governance is also very small. There's some policies that you can activate, but that's about it. So your project delivery is typically sped up in two days. Pretty nice. You can start using it to build prototypes. So instead of getting new backlog of epics and features and people working on stuff for months and years, you can sort of click yourself something together and show, hey, it's actually working, and now go build the, the real stuff. And also to meet demand, because, well, demand for IT sucks, right? Way too many job openings, way too less people that actually can fill them up. And if you have people filling them up, sometimes it's the question, should they be there? Different discussion. But for a developer, it's also nice to focus on actual new technology and innovation. Um, I do a little bit like the Face API of Azure and, and, and all the new stuff that's coming from there, and digital twins, etc. And having an interface to work with those technologies can sometimes be a pain in the ass. You need to set up your JavaScript, your server, your client, you need to work a web app, etc. And there comes a lot into play before you can actually start working on that new technology. So instead of focusing on that, you can just say, well, stick it in a local platform. What you see is what you get editor, you click in button, you click in a text field, and it's dynamical, and it's done. You can just focus on whatever you want to do. So it's nice to do some experimenting in it as well. Sensitive point is the uh, communication with business. Since you have low code, and people from the business start working with it as well, um, you have to talk to your business, and they are going to say something, and they're going to suggest some things. So it will help you improve communication with your business. It's a good point, it's a bad point. If you don't like the business, it's very bad, but for most people, it will help them actually get a better product that's actually being used. It can also help shape business initiatives because they don't any longer really need IT in the start, right? So they can build a prototype, see if this is actually going to work. Did we actually think about the process before asking IT to fix it? So they're fixing their own mess before it's actually going to the engineer. 
And it will eventually free developers from an inspiring task because they can actually focus on the cooler stuff. So it's sort of a prevent that situation. So when are we going to actually use something in a low-code domain in a business? Is it useful to use it always or are there some limitations? So one of the major areas that we take into account is the complexity of whatever it is that you're building an application and how scalable it should be. So first, if you have no code, it's a very small area in the process. If you have no requirements for scalability and your, com your, your complexity is very small, there's not really much to it. It's like click here, get an approval and done. No code is the way to go. If it becomes more complex, you know, like conditions and branches, etc. But if someone says this, then we need to do that. And, and you get more into low code because it makes you flexible and you can change stuff actually. On the other hand, if you're going to scale, low code typically, is, if there's no real business complexity, can help you because you can buy some licenses, you can get some more API requests, etc. So, scalability with not much business complexity is still doable in low code. But if you take it up a notch, and you have the most complex application, and you want astronomic scalability, you're still tied to pro code. So it's a win-win for everyone here, right? Yeah, yeah good point. Um, you can also take a look at this one. So what is the time to impact, and what is actually my impact and my ROI from the business side? And you can see I've pinpointed something white, gray, dark gray, whatever you want to call it, black, dark gray. Um, but you have something with fusion teams, which is basically local and broken people together. You have citizen desk, which is basically do it yourself. And you have the professional development in the corner. So you can see, okay, if it doesn't take too much time, they can do it themselves. If it takes some more time and the impact is there, then we can also work together. But eventually, again, if it takes a lot of time and it also has a lot of impact, you probably want to have it done properly. You want some Git integration maybe to see who's actually working on it, what did they do, some code comments, and then again, professional development. So maybe low code is not going to take over the world in 2024. Good news for that, right? So you can take the wider scalability and the flexibility and also the ROI and basically say, well, I have something there and there and there, and then I can plot my error. And the question that you should ask is, um, where is my error going to be? And that sort of determines if low-code, no-code, pro-code would be the best fit for your agenda. And to give you an example of low-code, um, this is Walt Disney. They have a website, and the website is basically for investors. And on that website, they say, well, look, this is the, the stock price, but this is the thing that we did uh, latest. This is the newest movies, the new uh, franchises that we brought up, uh, new attractions for our theme parks, etc. And the nice thing about this is that um, there's no IT engineer maintaining this page. It's all built in WordPress, it's literally you click on it and marketing can do it themselves. So it's a marketing website, fully run by marketing, and no IT actually taking a look at it. So it's just a nice example to show you that low code is more than just a stupid tool. And Zonfic, maybe you guys know Zonfic. They're like the biggest mining company in the world with very big machines and you name it. Um, but basically what they did, at one point in time they were like, okay, we need to streamline our operations, we need to modernize, we need to take sort of a way that everyone in the business can add value to our system. And they were like, okay, let's get rid of the idea of only having IT people doing a few applications a year. And they said, well, let's go with a power platform and dynamics from Microsoft. And now the whole operation is running with Citizen Dev. And there are like hundreds of applications being built by whoever wants to build them, so there's people from HR building something, and there's also people in trains that are like, oh, but it's annoying that every time when I take a stick of dynamite, I have to scan a picture, etc. now I can just do it with my phone. So everyone there is starting to digitally revolutionizing the company, which is quite a good example of a very, like, dinosaur sticky in the past company. So they're moving forward. And I already mentioned that if you have the idea of logo and Proco together, it's Fusion Dev. And what's Microsoft take on it? Well, we all know Git on that side where you can stick information and code in. If you combine that with something logo like Power Platform, you can use Power App to quickly create a Power App. Use Power Automate for some citizen dev friendly interactions and workflow automation. But you can combine it 
with Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, to create the components that you need, build your bicep files to host your information, and then you can use cognitive service inside of Loco, etc. So it's really a way to speed up whatever you're going to do and whatever your business wants to do. So Fusion Dev, sort of Loco and Code Pro combined. Why is it interesting? Just take a look at dependency and morale. So if you take on the left side the dependency on IT backhaul, right? Uh, we all know if you need something that's fully coded, then it's going to IT. IT is going to make an epic, and then there are some features, and then eventually there are some user stories. There will be some bugs that they need to fix, and then the user story, and the bug, and the user story, and the bug. So it's, it's going back and forth. They're very dependent. Well, low code, they need some external components at some point, so they will create some tickets, but they don't need a lot of dependency from IT. So they can be very quick in the process. No code, however, again, less dependency. But on the other hand, employee morale, if you take a look at all the papers, etc., that are produced, um, coding people typically have the lowest morale in the business when it comes to innovation and doing new stuff. And why? Mostly because of what they know and what they do. A lot of people in their day-to-day -day job, they tend to do whatever it is that they're good at, and they don't want to look outside it. And you probably have heard the terms T-shaped, and L-shaped, and V-shaped, and you name it. But basically, you get assigned something, you do that, and you don't look any further. And that's the problem with the coding people. But since low-code and no-code don't have really coding profiles and skill profiles, they tend to look beyond that. So their morale for innovation therefore increases. They, they don't are bound to those boundaries. It's easier for them to take a look into different opportunities, different techniques, different ways of solving a problem. And it's easy for them. So when you talk about low-code and pro-code, it's a bit like uh, King Kong versus Godzilla, right? So who do you want to be as the King Kong or Godzilla? No idea who is actually I can pro in this one. Who wants to be Godzilla? Who wants to be King Kong? Just a question for everyone who says I want to be King Kong. You have Godzilla, which is like the biggest lizard of all times, which is uh, chemically mutated, spitting fire, and radioactive, and you want to be a monkey. <laughs> That's a big monkey. <laughs> <laughs> Much great. It surprises me that in all ways like King Kong gets the most votes. It's, it's the most friendly one, it's like the big cutting bear. I don't know if I can get this, but okay, then, um, King Kong, most votes wins for King Kong. Um, so, okay, it's, it's low code versus pro code, but in my opinion, it's not really about low code versus pro code. So, it's more about change, getting it to work together. And we all know the change curve, like angle, denial, resistance, and eventually you're starting to adopt. But change is sometimes a, uh, a very painful process. And on the right side there, there's a, a very old man, which looks like the ancient Godzilla, but he's drinking a Coca-Cola can. Anyone an idea who that is? Uh, Warren Buffett, I heard someone saying. Yeah. It's Warren Buffett. Yeah. And why did I place Warren Buffett on a picture about change? Uh, Warren Buffett is one of the sort of best investors in America. It's the guy that has like the most shares of Coca-Cola. Um, but his sort of betting strategy with stocks is that whatever has been done in the last 50 years is not going to really change the next 50 years. And you can say, well, we have ChatGPT now and Dali is doing awesome stuff for us. But the human nature is not going to change. So we're still very resistant to stuff. We're still like, okay, but I want to have a car, I want to have a house, etc. So the basic needs and necessities of people aren't going to change. And that's how he became one of the richest investors. But his opinion is like, it's not going to change. So we need to think about how are we going to change them. And if you really want to make change, thanks, you did it very well. Keep your points, I want change. Um, it's not about trying to change something, but people, they should want to change. It, it, it's, it should be something that comes from themselves. So you can't enforce it. Just telling someone you should change, and they're like, good luck on that. So that's not going to work. You need to change it. And to that, you need to activate their mindset. And that can be very tricky because you want to get them hand in hand. And there might be some ways to do that, and I'm not going to talk about that because the theory of how you can change people, and we could talk for weeks. It's like literal cognitive studies, etc. on it. Um, 
but we want to have some hand in hand. And that is sort of the um, question we all have. If we take a look at the past, the present, and the future, um, why do we want to work together? Well, in the past, we had the Industrial Revolution. Um, we, we knew uh, how to produce iron. We started to make cool things. And that gave us cars. We could now drive to work instead of just walking there or taking a horse. So we had a revolution. And then probably everyone knew with COVID, the digital revolution happened. And we got the ability to work at distance. Teams calls all day long, right? Yay. Yay, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sarcasm in three, two, one. <laughs> but now we're going towards the future. And what's the biggest change in the future? Um, we're now going into what's called the social revolution. And the social revolution basically states that we want to work in a way that supports our needs. And how is that different from working at a distance? Well, working at a distance still means probably everyone together at nine till five. So you still have to arrange something for your kids. Your dog still needs to be walked, etc. So it's still like, okay, sorry, I've got a mailman coming and I need to take the parcel. And we still have to find an excuse on why we are away from our laptop for two minutes, right? And that sucks. So the idea of the social revolution is that we sort of want to work whenever it's convenient for us and not for our boss. It's like a utopia, but we're getting there. And the uh, future, therefore, is sort of built around if I want to work from Hawaii or wherever I want to work from, I should be able to do that. And that is going to ask a lot from my team. Because if you think about it, it's not only about, okay, now we need some extra servers because maybe I need to get uh, multiple regions working for my resources so people all over the world can access it. But it's also about, okay, it's no longer 9 till 5. Maybe someone at 12 o'clock is trying to log in. Okay, this week it's, it's, it's Russia, next week it's Poland, and the week after it is working from Spain. What is my policy now? So it also requires a lot of change from IT within the business. And then again, the demand for IT sucks, because who is going to build that change, right? And this is a picture from the United States. And why is it United States? Well, whenever you look something up at Google, you always find United States. Europe, no, we don't account. It's always America. So sorry for that, but it's the demand for IT. So the, the red line at top that is how much uh, jobs there actually are, and green how much jobs actually could be filled. So there was already in 2020 uh, almost a million jobs in the US that couldn't be filled, and it's only growing. And you take that all over the world, and then you can ask the question, okay, where are we going to find all the people that want to solve those problems? And the shortest answer is actually in your community, right? How many people do you know that can do something with IT? And it doesn't have to be full stack, but just a tiny problem is already enough to solve if you have a community doing a lot of small things together. And that's sort of, um, you all know, extreme home makeover. Well, I did a sort of an extreme community makeover. But if you take a look at this image, which is the normal distribution, and it says that you have typical some innovators, early adopters, and those are people that are like um, Elon Musk, and people that are like, oh, this is cool, let's do that. And then you have the early and late majority, also called the deliberate and skeptical people. They're like, okay, you've proven it, now I will do something. And after that group has done something, then the skeptical people are like, okay, now if you have that person on board, I really believe you. And then you have the laggards and the traditional people, and that's typical your manager and your CEO. They are never going to join. But the nice thing is, if you take a look at um, the community studies and, and look at, okay, a great team, how can I get that together? Um, if you have 15% of the group, and it's like only the left two boxes, so the smallest group there, if those two people in a community are going to be enthusiastic, immediately 75% will follow. So having just 15% of your community active is enough to get everyone on board to fix your problems. So let other people do some stuff, while you focus on the interesting stuff. That's sort of the idea that you want to do. So finding each other, and that's really what I like, is on the left we have programmers, stack overflowing everything. That's why we are programmers, right? And on the right you have the business claiming again, I have a problem with Excel. And if those two actually work together, collaboratively trying to reach something, then that's how I do it in the morning. <laughs> I'm running for coffee. But uh, in short, if you take a look at low code, um, it's not going to allow you to build applications that scale massively. So forget about it for an entire enterprise, one application for everything, that's not going to happen. 
you can create uh, useful complex applications already. Um, you can, however, very easily create complex applications. That's most notes and no code. <laughs> so one problem added for another problem. Um, however, be flexible enough. Collaboration, no, you cannot really work together. Um, Microsoft Power Platform, uh, very conveniently. Um, just a small story on that. They had sort of like a collaboration mode where multiple people at the same time could work in one application and make some changes, like you move with git commands and with pull requests, etc. But whenever uh, someone did a conflicting merge, then the entire solution got corrupted and you couldn't retrieve it anymore completely. So it was completely gone. So a nice addition. <laughs> and you wouldn't be surprised that they take it out of the preview and it's completely gone and nobody's talking about it anymore. So no collaboration if you use Power Platform. Nice. <laughs> oh, and you cannot really manage solutions and to it. On the other hand, um, if you have the community up and running and people can actually start using low code, they will sell themselves to the business. So you don't have to say, hey, we have a new application, start using this. You should change something, they will do it themselves. It's going to be a major part of uh, any business in the future. Gartner says it, so it should be true, right? It's like Facebook too. It will allow you to focus on interesting problems again, so you can do whatever it is that you like. It helps you to collaborate on business development, and not for everyone that's a bonus, but it will help you to do that. It will help you to manage your business from end to end, so at least now you're stuck in the business processes, you know what to do, how it should work, what will happen, so it will help you become one with the business, and it will help you to build a community that adopts it faster, richer, new and awesome applications. So something that you actually come up with will be used for a change. So in the future, there will be no real choice about are you going to use Procode, Locode, NoCode, whatever, Fusion Dev. In the future, you're going to probably use everything all over the place all the time. And yes, Shadow IT is going to be a big problem. That's up. But that's sort of my talk for today. So thank you very much. Think about your community next time, and Loco is going to give you a pain in the ass. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>
but you get like zip files that no other system can use and there are some components in there and XML files, etc. And it's all bits, it's rendered in the platform and you get like a description. So there's not much to maintain outside of the platform. Ghost tests are also low code or do you need a developer for that? Ah, um, that's also a good question. Uh, if you are going to create a canvas application, you can do it just in low code. If you want to test like a plugin or something from the dynamic stack, you will need a full code. Sure. <laughs> it's really easy shot. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.